Chapman for three. Bang! Oh! will get it for the win. Got it! He is hard to believe. Here's Jordan. Yes! The Magic, a 360 turn with the dribble. Magic down the middle. Gets underneath the world. He's laying down. Third in the corner. Double fake. What's going on, guys? Welcome back to another episode of Dime Dropper, another 2022 NBA playoff recap. Before we get started, please make sure to subscribe on YouTube at Dime Dropper Podcast, Apple Podcasts, follow us on Spotify, and of course, to follow us on all social media platforms at Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and TikTok at Dime Dropper Pod. For tonight's episode, going to be short and sweet. One game to talk about, the last game of the first round, a 2022 first round that did not Give us a Game 7, sadly. We only had one Game 7 in the first round last year. You can find that video on this channel. I was there, Clippers Mavs. But this year, sadly, we're not going to get a Game 7 in the first round, so we're going to have to hold out hope for the next rounds because the weak-ass Timberwolves, shout-out to Pat Bev. I still love you, brother, but we're going to get on on your guys' head for this one. Lost to the Memphis Grizzlies in how many games? Where would you hear it first? You hear it? You heard it? First here on Dime Dropper with my preview with Nat. I said Grizzlies in six. I didn't waver. And it really should not have been Grizzlies in six. It should have been Wolves in something. Honestly, Wolves in six, Wolves in five. The Timberwolves should have won this series. I'm going to talk about why. Let's talk about the game tonight. Very even to start. A lot of energy in the building, as you'd expect. And Anthony Edwards set the tone. Like we saw in game one, like we saw in the play-in game. Set the tone. You saw the Grizzlies. They started Xavier Tillman. Their defensive strategy was to do a lot of hedge recover or show and recover, whether it was the guards guarding the pick and roll or the bigs. And Ant just did a really good job of turning that corner or waiting till he got back one-on-one with his man and got right to the rim. A lot of dribble penetration and kicks for the Timberwolves in the first quarter. Carl Anthony Towns wasn't really getting the ball in the post or mid post or anything except for the first basket he made. Other than that, he was kind of just used as a pick-and-roll guy, pick-and-pop guy. D'Lo, fairly quiet in the first quarter. But the Timberwolves were on him. And then John Morant, the whole first half, and really the whole game, but the whole first half mainly, like 0 for 6. Like, he could not get anything going. Again, same thing. On the other side, though, they're hedging and recovering, too, with Towns coming up, and they're focused, and they're letting their, you know, the McDaniels, D'Angelo Russell, or whoever, Anthony Edwards, um, rotate. We're getting their length to rotate, trusting them to do so on the roller. And that was usually Brandon Clark. It also helps that he's not a shooting big man. But the Timberwolves, they did okay in the first, especially with John Morant. But Ja's still making some plays. He still had like five assists in the first half because he was finding Desmond Bain and Dylan Brooks for open threes. And some weren't even open threes. Desmond Bain and Dylan Brooks were hitting contested threes. D- Dylan hit like a step back and a sidestep contested. Desmond Bain hit a couple step backs. They were firing. But the Timberwolves led in the first quarter, 29 to 28. Another guy who I thought was really good for Minnesota tonight was Jaden McDaniels. He was amazing all game, both ends of the floor. His length guarding jaw, his making open threes, five of six from deep tonight for him. He was just awesome. And his length on defense, shot blocking. He got one block. It was a from behind against, I believe, Jaron Jackson Jr., if I'm not mistaken. or No, it was Brandon Clark in the fourth quarter. But anyway, Wolves up by one after one. Second quarter, saw some good minutes from Kyle Anderson, some decent minutes from Tyus Jones. Greg Monroe played in this game for seven minutes because Nas Reed missed the game for personal reasons, which did hurt the Wolves. He actually had a pretty solid series. And Monroe, he actually got he actually didn't get exposed in pick and roll. I didn't think they didn't go to him in in pick and roll enough, I thought the Grizzlies. But when they did, he just hedged, recovered. It was all good. You know, their rotations were fine. And somebody who I thought was just unbelievable put the biggest smile on my face. I'm going to send him a tweet later tonight because it just put the fattest smile on my face seeing my favorite college player ever, Jordan McLaughlin from USC. Spent four years with us here. I saw him play live at the Galen Center his sophomore year against Utah, against Jakob Pertl and Kyle Kuzma for my first time. I was in high school and Jordan McLaughlin's a guy that I really modeled my game after in many ways. It remind, you know, we like players a lot of times because they 
remind you of the way you play or you want to play like them. And in Jordan's case, I was already in high school and I kind of had gotten a certain play style and Jordan, he reminded me of myself. He's just a smaller guard, smart decision-making, doesn't do too much, sometimes can be a little bit less confident than he should be in terms of looking for his own shot because he actually can score, he can get to the rim, he can shoot, but makes the right plays, doesn't do too much and competes. And Jordan McLaughlin, you can see tonight, he had the highest basketball IQ of any guy on the Wolves because he spent four years in college. Like I said, in the NBA getting better and better, how that helps IQs. And he just was calm. Like this Wolves team we've talked about is low IQ. They won the, the second quarter, 23-21. And by the way, if you're wondering how J-Mac played, as I said, he competed, made good reads in pick and roll, made really nice passes, nice passes where he pushed the ball and found a trailer in transition. One time he found Towns and he went had a full head of steam, got to get all the way to the basket for a dunk. That was only a six point of the game, Carl Anthony Towns. And D'Lo still quiet in that first half. And then the second half, with uh, they had kept John Morant at bay, Done a really good job. Brandon Clark, still really good, though. Jaron Jackson Jr., it's crazy. He got, he shot 15 times. I didn't feel like he shot that many times. Most of them were, yeah, that's interesting. But anyways, third quarter, the Grizzlies lost it 32-25. And it was kind of towards the end of the third quarter that the Wolves kind of started turning up on him because it was pretty even again for the majority of it. Still didn't see too many adjustments to me from either side. Towns is still doing his Towns thing. And D'Lo is still not really getting going. But at one point, you started seeing J Jordan McLaughlin get MVP chance. I, again, I didn't think Jordan was going to make the league because of his size. He was undrafted and everything. For him to be getting MVP chance in a playoff game, game six, like deep in a series, it's insane. It's like, I'm touched. I'm touched for sure. A proud fan. But John Morant, he started waking up a little bit more in the second half. But one thing Josh struggles with, besides the fact that he just can't shoot. You know, we saw him hit threes all season. Teams went under the screen and he burned them. Like, he burned my Clippers when we went under the screen. Opening night. You can see the video of it. It's on my channel. Or the one in Memphis. But he just doesn't seem to have this jumper in the playoffs. And the thing is, too, a lot of teams aren't really going under the screen with him. They're either hedging with – well, the Wolves were hedging a bit with Colin Anthony Towns all series long, just trying to take away the drive. He still was able to turn the corner here and there in the series. But they were trying to take away that drive, make him get rid of the ball. And that's part of why you saw Desmond Bain have such a great series shooting the ball because he got so many open yeah, looks. And the Grizzlies do a really good job moving the ball. And you saw a lot of that tonight where they got open threes, but open threes off of jaw penetration and then making multiple passes. So Jaw does a really good job of breaking down your defense, even if he's not shooting well, that's for sure. He's going to put constant pressure on you. He's going to make you play defense without fouling. And he still did good things tonight in that sense. But another thing Jaw struggles with too that I've noticed is he, and my friend Will pointed this out, shout out to him on Twitter. When he gets, when guys are going over the top of screens on him and he's getting to the paint, he doesn't like realize that a guy is that the guy that was guarding him is chasing him over that screen and is on his back because he got blocked and caught several times from behind in this series, mainly by Patrick Beverly, but lost the ball a good amount. And he's just got to be a little bit more under control, a little bit more patient and a little bit more wary of his surroundings as well. And, you know, he could get away with it in this series, but that's not going to be the case against Golden State. But anyways, the, the Timberwolves. You started seeing them make a little run at the end of the third quarter, which gave them an 84-74 lead going into the fourth. But as of as, after watching this series for five games, you knew that, first of all, a 10-point lead in today's NBA is nothing. And secondly, you know with the way the Wolves have been playing that that lead ain't safe. And one thing, um, one thing about the fourth quarter is the way the Wolves started it, they, they set a horrible precedent to start the fourth quarter. You know what I'm saying? They This is how they started it. Turnover, Wolves, uh, Grizzlies hit a three. And then Carl Anthony Towns shoots a contested three with 12 on the shot clock. Tyus Jones comes down and hit a, hits a three. Now it's a three-point game, just like or a four-point game, just like that. Just like that. And the, the, the most annoying part again, Malik Beasley, 12 seconds on the shot clock, shoots another three. Like, and, and funny enough, the Wolves still made a another push to cushion the lead. And guess who it came with? Jordan McLaughlin. Two amazing pick and roll reads, bounce passes to Jaden, one to Jaden McDaniels, another to Carl Anthony Towns. And that made it 91-84. And the Grizzlies called timeout. Now, one thing that really made me mad 
was Carl Anthony Towns throughout the game. He did not get enough paint touches in terms of, okay, let's put it this way. When he got in the paint, a lot of those times, it was because he would catch the ball at the three-point line and try to drive to the paint like a guard. But you have to understand, he's seven feet pushing that weight downhill against set defenses in a half-court set. So it's not the same as what I said in game in game one, where he was catching the ball and picking pops, and he had space to drive into. He's catching the ball and driving into the set defense or trying to take his guy off the dribble. And what he doesn't understand is it's so easy to call offensive fouls when a guy's just barreling through the lane like that. That's exactly what Giannis figured out, to be the roller more in pick and roll, to start his move deeper on the catch when he gets the ball. And a couple of times, Carl Anthony Towns caught the ball. When he caught it deep, it was in the straight middle of the paint outside the restricted area so the defense could all collapse. He got blocked twice by Brandon Clark, you know, some near fouls. But he doesn't catch the ball on the block. He doesn't do enough work at all off the ball. It's the same problem AD has. The same problem I criticize. Um, do I criticize Embiid for that? It's mainly Anthony Davis. Because Embiid, he's still, this season he has shown that he's get on the block, gets to the line, all that. Carl Anthony Towns, he shies so far away from the physicality. You know, he did better this series than he did against Houston four years ago. But this was just pathetic sometimes. The way he's neglected the part of his game that made him the number one pick. The reason why I started becoming a fan of him. He doesn't go to the post at all. He doesn't go at all. It's like insane to me. He And the reason why I bring it up that it was so detrimental, it wasn't as bad in the first quarter, but in the fourth quarter, he had Dylan Brooks on him for like three possessions and wants to take him off the dribble facing up behind the three-point line. Like, bro, buddy, where's your IQ at? Again, this goes back to that same bullshit. Oh, look at this seven-footer that's got handles, tween, has he step back. Bro. That's still going to play to the defense's advantage when you when it comes down to it. It looks pretty. It looks pretty in the regular season. You can get hot. That shit is not going to work when they're playing physical on you. Good defensive teams. He needed to get easy baskets, and he didn't. And another thing about him is when he's around the paint, almost every single time he went up this series around the paint, it's an offensive foul, like liability almost. Like it's like you, you're scared he's going to get an offensive foul. He's like, where are his post fundamentals that he developed at Kentucky? I know it's not this bad. Dude's just shoving people, elbowing, hooking, just lowering the shoulder. You don't, you need to do all this to get a, to get a clean look around the rim as a seven footer. Seriously. Like, I know they're fouling you. I know they're hacking you. And another thing is his body language. Like, it's like, he's complaining so much. It's like, he's looking for the foul. He doesn't go up strong. It's, it's Siamese cat. It's really Siamese cat to put it, put it nicely insane to me and it's that's not even guys it gets worse like it was a pretty neck-to-neck -neck game because the grizzlies kept in the story of the series offensive rebounds what's my main catchphrase no rebounds no rings and that held true in this series for the wolves who did not get defensive rebounds in the second halves enough and a main man who was attacking the offensive glass all series long and was arguably the best player in the whole series in my opinion brandon clark 17 points 11 boards and five assists tonight to go along with three blocks and five offensive rebounds 17 for the grizzlies as a team to six for the wolves 37 to 56 in the rebounding battle in favor of memphis and that's a story of the game in the series in many ways Nobody besides Carl Anthony Towns on the Minnesota Timberwolves got more than five rebounds. And I bet you could see that Carl Anthony Towns should have gotten more himself. And that being said, the game was still there for the taking. And D'Angelo Russell, you know, I got to say about him, I'm a big fan of D'Lo's. But D'Lo, he struggled majorly in this series. Just did not hit his shots. The shots that we've become accustomed to seeing D'Lo hit his whole career. And it's like, we got to ask some serious questions about this man's development now. How serious is he throughout a regular season? He didn't seem like he really developed a great rhythm at all. Maybe I'm wrong on that. If you're a Wolves fan, let me know. But he didn't develop any rhythm in this series. He had some decent games. He still created some good shots. But we know D'Lo's never been the quickest guy to take you off the dribble. So all his shots, you know, a lot of it is tough shots if it's isolation. And the Grizzlies were doing a lot of hedge recover tonight. So that was forcing isolation and forcing the ball out of his hands, not letting him get in the paint, no drop coverage. So D'Lo just wasn't finding many clean looks, and he wasn't hitting his contested shots that he's made a living off of. So Chris Finch elected to bench him, and Jordan McLaughlin closed the game, which was, I mean, a joy for me to see, but it's tough, you know? And I think that's one of the biggest reasons they lost too. 
when you look at the whole series, if you look at the big three of the Wolves, D'Lo was the one that didn't show up at all, really. Did he even have 25 points in one game? This is D'Angelo Russell. you got to have at least one 30-point game in a series in the modern NBA. Come on. Everyone's scoring 30 these days. Even in the playoffs, a lot of guys are scoring 30. Guys with D'Lo's ability are scoring 30. You know, And they're not just zeroing in on D'Lo the way Jaws getting zeroed in on, Donovan, Trey Young. It's not like that. So he's getting looks that he's made his whole career, and he hasn't made he didn't make them. Oh man! And then the big plays at the end of the game, guys, that really decided this one for me. It was ninety nine, ninety eight, three forty six to go. Carl Anthony Edwards started getting really aggressive in the fourth quarter. Dylan Brooks fouled out of the game on a Patrick Beverly charge attempt that he took, and it was a good one with just under five minutes to go. And Dylan Brooks had a really solid game, even though he was cooling down. But obviously, he's much better on defense than Tyus Jones because now you're running with two small guards with Jones and Jaw. So that was an advantage that they had. And it was 99-98, right? 319 to go. Carl Anthony Towns missed an, like a long two. Not a terrible shot. I didn't mind it. And then they come back down the other end, run a pick and roll. Carl Anthony Towns hedges. They make the jaw makes the pass to Brandon Clark, the right one, and BC makes the four on three read. Good pass to Desmond Bain. Patrick Beverly fly by. Bad closeout. Desmond Bain makes him pay like he has all series. Not much, you know, you'd have to really dissect that defensive play to get into it. But Pat Bev, the closeout was poor. And good ball movement by the Memphis Grizzlies and a big shot by Desmond Bain. John Morant with the hockey assist. But what really, really, really pissed me off was after he made that three. And after, you know, in fact, a couple of misses, actually. Anthony Edwards uh, missed a, you know what happened? Anthony Edwards gone to the lane, spun and missed a floater because he hadn't really shot any floaters tonight, at least from my memory. Not one in the second half for a minute. So he just, sh he just short armed it. He thought, you know, he thought he put enough on it. He didn't put enough on it. He airballed, but they were still able to get a couple of stops. I'm sorry. What happened was they gave up three shots after that. Three shot attempts for the Grizzlies. They did not rebound. One, Jordan McLaughlin was at fault on the second one. John Morant got an offensive rebound. And then the first one, I believe it was a mix of Vanderbilt and Towns. I can't remember, but they didn't get the offensive rebound. I believe it was Bain. Yeah, Bain got an offensive rebound. And then John Morant got by Jordan McLaughlin and had an incredible finish in traffic. And that's when you knew after making two big plays in a row, John Morant, as he has done all series, even in some terrible games, has started to get better as the game went on, which is a true, true sign of a star. He started getting better in the last couple of minutes. But what really pissed me off, and this play honestly resembles, like is a good encapsulation of the whole series to me. They're down by four. The momentum is completely against them. It's 103.99. There's two minutes and 15 seconds left. And with like 12 on the shot clock or 14 on the shot clock, Carl Anthony Towns takes a literal 28 footer contested not even close time and place what separates great players you want to talk about see this is why i don't like this argument of he's a better shooter he's a better rebounder like just judging the game like that categories that way because what difference does it make if you can do all those things but you don't know when to use those things and when to go to certain things what not to do at certain times and that comes from watching games. And that's why the eye test is so big for me. It's not about, oh, the eye test, meaning your bag is nice. That's not my eye test. My eye test is seeing what decisions you make. And as I always say, what buttons to push and when to push them and what you do in big moments. And Carl Anthony Towns failed every single one of those things I just said in this series. He showed me that his IQ after seven years, he plays like a rookie. He takes first quarter shots in the fourth quarter. And he didn't learn anything. And the only chance for this team to take the next step is for Ants to keep getting better because he's got it. Carl Anthony Towns, he's got it in terms of being an all-star in the NBA. But then that next level, that superstar level, which he has the talent to be at, in my opinion, it doesn't seem like he's going to get there. He needs to watch some tape or something because it was that's just a ridiculous shot. And funny enough, they still got a good stop. Anthony Edwards played good D on John Morant. And then Carl Anthony Towns made a nice four-on-three read himself to Jaden McDaniels, who had another three and cut the game down to one. But this was really the shot that, kind of ended it for me. John Morant, five seconds left on the shot clock. Jordan McLaughlin came and stunted at him and, or kind of a double basically. 
and Ja went tween, tween, and then through the, to protect the ball. Noticed there was a defender in front of him and behind him trying to poke at it and threw the ball on a live drill with his left hand back to Tyus Jones for an open three, and he drained it. And Tyus Jones has made some big shots in this series, especially in those second half comebacks in you know game games five and and three. But what a pass by Jaw! You know the ability to have such a tough game and still make plays like that at the end. And, you know, put him up by four was I thought that was the series. They still scored on the other end though. The um, the Wolves, Jordan McLaughlin on a layup. And then same thing, John Morant, high pick and roll. Towns comes out, double team, get it to Brandon Clark, four on three read, dumps it off to Jaron Jackson, dunk. And that's the series. 114 to 106, the Memphis Grizzlies win in six, as I predicted. The Minnesota Timberwolves blow a 10 another for the third time in the series, a double digit lead in the fourth quarter. Let's read the stat lines for this one. Tyus Jones, 10 points off the bench and four assists on four of nine shooting and two of six from deep. Thought he had a great series doing his job. And then Brandon Clark, maybe the player of the series, you let me know. 17 points, 11 boards, five assists, three blocks, five of nine shooting, five offensive rebounds, seven of eight from the line. And then the starters, I'm not even going to say Xavier Tillman because he only played 11 minutes, but Dylan Brooks, 32 minutes played, maybe his best game of the entire series tonight, 23 points. He did foul out, nine for 19 shooting, five for six from deep. Some big shots in this game. And then Jaron Jackson Jr., 6 for 15 from the field, 3 for 6 from deep. Those were big. He hit his first three, and he shot 50% from there, so that was huge. Another night with the Grizzlies shot well from three, 15 for 33, 45.5%, and I don't think they shot too many of them either, which was really good. So they got to be more on that kind of time against the Warriors. 18 points and 14 boards for, for Triple J. That's a good stat line. Good double-double. Was active as usual. Desmond Bain. Maybe also a claim for player of the series. 23 points and seven rebounds. Nine for 15 shooting, 60%, and five and nine from deep. That dude just lights out from three. And then Ja, 17 points, eight rebounds, 11 assists, five turnovers, though. Four for 14 shooting and 0 for five from three. Nine for 12 from the line. He needs to not shoot five threes in a game. I don't think he even needs to shoot more than two. But John's need to, John needs to be way more efficient in that next series. The only thing I'll give the, the Grizzlies in that next series is the rebounding battle. I think the Warriors could struggle on the glass. But if the Warriors just rebound, they'll take care of them in, in six, five games, six games max. The Grizzlies still make too many bad decisions, and they're too reluct, reliant on the three ball. And the three ball, that comes from a lot of John Morant high pick and roll, whereas the Warriors, it can come from a variety of places. And they get a lot of points on cuts because they're moving without the ball. So I think the Grizzlies are in trouble. I forget that the Grizzlies have home court. So I'm going to go with the Warriors in six. I just think that they have the best player in the series with Steph, experience. They're better defensively. The Grizzlies' defense, as as good as it was in the regular season, it's not as good as it's advertised to me. I just think that they're still a little young and can have miscommunications. And the Warriors, I think the Warriors will beat them up. And I'm, I'm going to be excited to see that. Now, the question is, can Jaw have a better series? We'll see. The Warriors have some good defenders. One of the best defenders. The, the, they were number one in defensive rating in the league. I'd say they're not better than the Celtics, though, at this moment in time defensively. But they're going to switch a lot. You're going to see a lot more switching. The Timberwolves didn't switch as much. You're going to see a lot more of that. You're going to see more Jonathan Kaminga if you're the Warriors because of his athleticism. So it'll be a fun series. But I got the, grit, I the, I got the dubs in six. As for the Wolves, this was a very successful season. But they could have done more. And they're going to keep getting better. But it's it's built through Anthony Edwards. And I don't know what Delo's contract situation is, but they're going to have to maybe think about moving on in a bit. Because I don't know if he's going to get any better anymore. And that's the scary part. Because Delo had a lot of potential. And I think he's a little bit lazy. And I'm happy he made the playoffs for the second time in, in his career. But he did not perform like he did the first time. Tonight's stat lines. Sabi for Jordan McLaughlin. Nine points, five rebounds, four assists, one steal, zero turnovers. Uh, four for five shooting. I, I'm so happy for that guy. Jaden McDaniels, he had a great season. I think he has a really bright future and has a really big future in Minnesota as well. He's going to be great next year, I believe. 24, I don't know why he didn't start over Vanderbilt. They should maybe consider that. 24 points, eight of nine shooting, five for six from deep in 33 minutes. He was awesome, 24, as I said. Vanderbilt only played 12 minutes, so no reason to really talk about him. Pat Bev, I thought he had a solid series, did what he could, really harassed job as he could. Gonna be good for them next season if he can. I don't know what his contract situation is, but 
he was great for them this season. Just changes the culture, makes your team more serious, makes every game more serious. 10 points, four rebounds, three assists, two steals and a block, three of eight shooting, two for five from three. Could have maybe made one more three, but you got 10 points from Pat Bev, you're living with it. And then the three, the big three. By the way, 40 to 22 in favor of Memphis in the fourth. So that's just embarrassing. Another fourth quarter collapse. And the Timberwolves actually took care of the ball decently. They only had 11 turnovers, four of them from D'Angelo Russell, though, who only had seven points on three of seven shooting and one of three from deep and didn't get to the line once. Four assists, three steals, but D'Lo, man. I don't know what to say. And then Cat, 18 and 10, four assists, two turnovers, six for 19 shooting and 0 of three from deep. Six of nine from the line. That That's just what you can't afford to have as well. 66% from the line, dude. You're too good of a shooter for that. Best big, best shooting big man ever. Give me a fucking break, bro. I don't want to hear that shit ever again. And you know what? Dirk had his fair share of struggles uh, in his career in terms of um, playoffs in the beginning, even up to like year 12. But he, he still was better at, he still had accomplished more at this stage of his career than Cat. Well, this is Cat's seventh year, so Dirk would have been 2005. Yeah, I'm pretty sure. I mean, in 2003, the Mavs were nasty, so whatever. And then Anthony Edwards, I thought he played well. I wouldn't put this much on this one on him. Yeah, he airballed a floater, but maybe should have made one more free throw for really picking and choosing. 30 points, five boards, five assists, two steals, two blocks, 10 for 24 shooting, and four for 10 from deep, six of eight from the line. The Grizzlies win the series 114-106. It's the Memphis Grizzlies' first series win since 2015 when they defeated the Portland Trailblazers in, I believe, five games and then lost to the Warriors in what I believe. And I'm going to do a video on this series one day in, in more depth. But I think this is that was the series that changed the NBA forever. Memphis versus Golden State 2015. It was the only, it was the only good team to me, that like really good team that the Grizzlies, that the Warriors faced in that run because we choked against the Rockets. And I also believe that, well, also, and Conley and Tony Allen were a little injured. Ugh, Warriors fans don't want to hear that, but I'm not saying that the Warriors would have lost. Anyway, that's it for me tonight, guys. That's it for the Minnesota Timberwolves season. So let's take a look at my picks, right? Heat and five, check. Um, Suns in five. Eh, well, Suns in six. Who's the freaking two seed in the East? The Boston Celtics and the Brooklyn Nets. I had Celtics in seven. Eh, sweep. I had Grizzlies in six. Ding. That one was right. So two for four. And then Bucks in five. Ding. Also right. So that's three of them. And then on the other side, it was... Warriors and Nuggets, Warriors and five. Also got that one right. And then I had, I didn't know because of Luca. I said either Mavs and, either Mavs and, I said if Luca plays Mavs in six, and then if if he doesn't, oh no, I'm sorry. I said Mavs in seven if Luca plays and Jazz in six. So I was wrong on that one. And then the last one was, Philly and, and Toronto where I had Philly in seven and it was Philly in six. So I was four, four for eight, 50%. I'll take it. I wasn't off by two games. Actually, no, I was on the Celtics series, but so here are my picks for the second round. And I think we have an amazing second round ahead of us. So one of the best in, in recent memory. Although last year was pretty good. I mean, Clippers jazz was fun, especially for me. Nets bucks was a classic series. I think we're going to be talking about series for years and years to come. Philly Atlanta was pretty fun. I mean, it, in terms of long-term impact on the Sixers franchise, that Ben Simmons moment is going to be never forgotten. So I thought that was, I don't think any, I mean, game seven was historic for that reason, but the series wasn't too exciting, even though there were some good games in there, like game five where the Sixers choked. And then yeah, what was the other series? Oh yeah. The Nuggets Suns was weak. So yeah, I think this year we're going to be excited. By the way, if I, I need to talk about Joel Embiid real quick. I know that's going to be asked, and it's so sad, man. It's so sad. Orbital fracture. I don't know if I mentioned that in the live last night, but I did see that play because I was watching the game. Siakam 
going into Embiid because Embiid had done the airplane, guys. He was he was he was boasting. Show you know what I'm saying? He was rubbing it in a little bit. And I think Siakam just was like, I'm just gonna go take it at this man. And he has an orbital fracture now, and they're gonna say he's out indefinitely. Probably gonna be out for game one. So now the Heat should go up two nothing if they have the opportunity to have two games without Embiid. But it's just so sad to see because Embiid just can't stay healthy in the playoffs. But this wasn't his fault at all. This was a freak accident. I think he's going to pl definitely play in the series. He's going to have to wear a mask again like 2018. It's just tough. He's already got the finger injury. It's brutal. But I, don't, I think the Sixers are frauds anyway. I told you guys. I think just Harden's bound to flame out, especially with a team that can switch everything like the Heat. They're going to make him play one-on-one, -on -one and they're going to really see if his quick step is still there. they got really long defenders. P.J. Tucker knows Harden, so he's going to try to get after him. And then Embiid is going to play against Bam, so we'll see how that goes. And the Heat are just better coached. I think they move the ball better and, get, and smarter. They have three stars to the Sixers, too, even though the Sixers, you know, if Harden plays like Harden, could have the two best players in the series on a given night. But we'll see how it goes. I'm taking the Heat in six, though. And then I'm also taking the Celtics in six with Middleton out the whole series. I know that may be a hot take. I know people are still going with Giannis. People are still saying Celtics in seven. I'm going to go with the Celtics in six. And then I'm going to go with the Warriors in six. And I'm going to go with. The Suns in seven games. I think that one's going the distance. I think Luka is going to really show you guys what's up in this series. He's going to be the best player in the series. And we'll see how Devin Booker looks. It's really all dependent on that. If Booker had never gotten hurt, I would have said Mavs and uh, Suns in six. But I think it's going to go seven. And we'll see if DeAndre Ayton, despite how good a defender he is in space, how well he's going to do if the Mavs go five out and if they start hitting threes like they did in this series. Uh, you're going to see a lot of Dorian Finney-Smith on Devin Booker. And I'm just interested to see how Chris Paul does against the Mavs because they're a better defense than the Pelicans for sure. But it's going to be a great second round, guys. 2019 was an awesome second round that year. We had the game seven. We had game seven in Portland, Denver, game seven, Philly, and Toronto. And then we had a great six game series of Golden State, Kyrie Irving's quit job, whatever. So that was fun. The second round is honestly my favorite round. Actually, no, it's not. I used to never say that because the Clippers used to always lose in the second round. I used to say the first round was my favorite. But I'm, I'm, I'm actually, the last couple of years, the second round has become my favorite because there's still a good amount of games where there's eight teams left. I can watch all of them without this three-game stuff. I hate the three games. And then the quality of basketball is just so good. You have such good teams. And by the, as I said, this is the best Eastern Conference four teams remaining of my lifetime. And the best series, Celtics, Bucks, since in the East, since LeBron was with the Heat. That's it for me tonight, guys. I'm going to go to the live subscribers now. Super Chats are turned on if you want to drop a dollar, a dime. Obviously, no episode tomorrow since there's no game. So enjoy your night away from me. I'll enjoy my night away from you guys. Just kidding. I love you guys. And then Sunday, the second round begins. So we're back for that. And I'm going to see what I can do. By the way, just know I have videos lined up for um, the offseason as well. And we're going to be really much more active this offseason than last offseason for a variety of reasons. But... That's it tonight, guys. Now we're going to go to the live subscribers. Peace. Ooh, what's up, boys? Solid night tonight. I know it's a Friday night. Not as popular. Should have been a game seven, says Pasha, man. Damn right. Mr. Cheese did. My boy Ryan says big prr. Mikey T says Ant is legit. Need J-Mac to start next season. He's a much smarter and better fit for Ant. Wow, that's a hot take. Laura King says, okay, love hearing you talk about the game, but it was cool hearing a little personal stories mixed in. Definitely want to hear more of that. Okay, noted. I, I got you. I got you for sure. It's just like, sometimes I feel like if I talk, it's like, what level did you play at, bro? Like, no, I didn't play D1 or anything like that. Like high level college or even low level college. Like I'm just a hooper. Um, played growing up. So I, I like that you appreciate that. Ja'Cory Marshall says, I can't wait for this West. Semi some good games. I think the East is better though, to be honest, but at least the all four series are going to be great. Joel out for game one dime as well. That's That's been confirmed, Ja'Cory. T-Bulls should have won in five. They blew three fourth quarter leads. Carl should join the bum-ass Clippers. Bum-ass Clippers? Bro, You, I'm sorry, man. You can't be talking this year. If you want to talk about the past, you can talk about the past. But you, if there's no team more bummy than the Lakers this year. Like, you guys are the bums of the universe. I saw it, like, I was walking down, like, Skid Row the other day, and I saw, like, LeBron, Stanley Johnson. Wayne Ellington and Austin Reeves, like just eating a sandwich, sharing them between themselves. Five of them just all eating one sandwich. It was, it was like just poverty. Like just, it resembles where the franchise is at right now. Super sheep says cat's been a huge disappointment. One game looks like Dirk Nowitzki. Next game he plays like Ennis Cantor. Nah, man. Cause Ennis Cantor at least would hit a couple jump hooks. 
<laughs> Mikey and Jesus agree about the Grizzlies Warriors series. Kazilla. Is that my boy Kaz from England? What's good, Dime? D'Lo and Cat were weak tonight. Some of these playoff performances from these teams in the West make me more confident we can do something next year. Yeah, bro. Like, you know what I want? My ideal route. I want the Timberwolves first round. I want the Grizzlies second round. And I want to play the fucking Suns. It, hypothetically, I would love it we could beat the Warriors and the Suns next year. But and we don't need to play the Warriors. Because I don't want to just... I'd rather not play the Warriors at all because the, the, the Bay Area fans and the Steph Curry fanboys are going to flood Staples Center. And that just, I'm not ready for that. So I'd rather have Suns, Wolves, and Grizzlies. That'd be like an ideal route to the championship. Jacory Marsh says, yeah, I've been confirmed he's out. So Heat 1 0. They got to win that. Chance for James Harden to, to have a game of his life. Haha, <laughs> bums of the universe. Luca beating Suns? Maybe. Man, imagine if he does that. That would be crazy. That'd be like in, uh, the Pistons to me in 2007. Pistons were not even the oh yeah, they were the number one seed. They were the number one seed. No, they were number two. Right? The Pistons were the number two seed in 2007. Who the hell was number one? No, the Pistons were number one. Who the fuck was the number one seed? It was the Pistons, because yeah, it was the Pistons because the Cavs were second. Yeah, it was the Pistons. Played against the Magic. Now I'm remembering. Pick it the magic. Anyway, any last questions, guys? 2007. Remember I did the whole 2006 playoffs for you guys? I wonder if I could do 2007 off the top of my head. Want to see me try? I don't know if I could. Off top dome. Corey Marsh says, Carol Lucky, Draymond ain't on that team. Who the hell is Carol? Uh, 2007 playoffs. Why not? Let's do it for my own memory. Number one versus eight. Let me see, let someone get a fact check on me. Pistons and Magic was number one versus the eight. And the Pistons won in five, I believe. Then the Mavs and the Warriors on the other side. That was a legendary series. One versus eight. First time a, a eight seed winning a best of seven. Um, Four, two dubs. And then Cavs swept the Wizards because there was no Gilbert Arenas and I believe no Karan Butler. Two of the big three was out. Two of the big three were out. Dime, are you going to make some offseason Clipper trade videos? And yeah, bro, it's me from England. Keep doing your thing. Appreciate you, bro. Um, Clipper trade videos? Probably not because, I don't know, it just doesn't really in, in, excite me to do like transfer news. and submit. You know what? I'll do this. If we make trades, I'm going to react to them. But I don't like the speculation stuff because like I know people like it, but I don't like playing fake GM. Like, I don't know. I just, until I'm actually working in a front office, like it's just, you can, you can think of like a thousand million scenarios where I, I'd much rather do my historic timeline for you guys. Like I've been trying to do like, that's part of the, that's another goal of mine in this channel. It's not just to cover the modern NBA. Like I want to set myself apart with the history of the game. So I need to keep making those videos. Let's get to the eighties guys. Let's get the magic and bird. I'm so ready. I'm so ready, man. And we got to finish the seventies. So that's the goal for the summer. We got to get to the eighties and then help, hopefully have some guests. Definitely have some guests. So hopefully, I told you, 2022 is the year we're going to get NBA players on. I'm not joking about that. We're going to do it. Uh, I'm not kidding. We're going to find a way to do it. But yeah, if we if we make trades and the major trades, I'll react to those. But other than that, his, history content. History content, maybe some Dodger vlogs, but mainly history content and guests. I also may have an occasional once a week podcast just talking about any certain topic. Probably history, though, mostly. Matt Carl, my bad. All right, what else? I'm going to keep going my 07. I'm going to shut off. 07, Lakers, Suns, two versus seven, Suns in five. That was a boring series. Three versus six was San Antonio versus Denver. That was the first year the Nuggets had Iverson. Spurs, one in five. And then. New Jersey versus Toronto. That was a Bosch. Vince Carter playing his old team. Nets one in six. What's weird is that Toronto had home court for that, if I recall correctly. That's wild. It's crazy that Toronto had home court. They really had a damn. I'm not gonna look it up, but they did have home court. And then you had 
the Rockets and the Jazz. Oh man, that was. Hey, I feel you. Still waiting on that Kobe vid. It's coming. It's just going to be much more thoroughly researched this time. Um, T Mac crying in the press conference in Game Seven against the Jazz, and they lost at home. It was so sad. That was the best first round series of that year for sure. That wasn't a great first round. It's 2007, but that T Mac against the Jazz was. I take this year's first round over that one. That one just has more nostalgia. I call it more quality basketball just because it's smarter. Well, not smarter in terms of like scoring more points, but like just I think they played more intelligently in terms of, you know, relative to the systems and whatever, like the way the game was played. Just just more calculated, I should say. More checkers, less – I'm sorry, more chess, less checkers. But um, what was the 4-5 in the East that year? Oh, it was Miami when they got swept by Chicago. That was interesting. And then the Pistons beat them in five in the second round, and then the Cavs played the Nets and beat them in six in the second round. And then the Rockets, no, Jazz, it was Jazz versus Warriors. That was in Baron Davis, Duncan Andre Karolenko. That was nuts series. I think the Jazz won in five. That's crazy, man. The Mavs lost in six and the Jazz won in five. You know what it is, I think? It's because the, the Jazz went were kind of small too. They kind of matched them small ball over small ball. I have to go back and watch that series, but I know that the I remember game two vividly. Like the this, whoa, 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 big stool, my fucking guy. Look at you in the live tonight, my G. Bucks or Celtics? I said Celtics in six. I said Celtics in six. Hey, yo, Stu, I know you're sweating over there, man. We can't get to these Celtics getting ring number eighteen, bro. Can't let them. I'm a Lake, I'm a Clipper fan, but I don't know if I want them Celtics to get ring number 18. My friends at UMass are gonna be loud and proud. Oh man. But anyways, uh shit. And then of course everybody knows these comments. By the way, the best series in 2007. If any of you guys want to watch a great series, Suns and Spurs 2007. That's the best chance the Phoenix Suns have ever gotten in the Nash era to win a championship. The famous suspension with Robert Ori. I'm sorry, with Amari Stoudemire after Robert Ory checked Steve Nash into the scores table. Oh, man. And Boris Diel and him getting suspended for game five. And then, of course, the Pistons, Cavs, the series that LeBron shocked the world. I'll never forget that. Yeah, he said we can't let them get that. You already know. Oh, man, they look dangerous, though, bro. They really look. This is the best Celtics. I was saying this is the best Celtics team since Garnett and Pierce. Like, wouldn't you agree? It's like no doubt to me. And then what was the... Western Conference Finals, Spurs and, and Jazz was weak. We knew the Spurs. The second the the, the Jazz, the, the second the, the, the Mavericks got upset by Golden State, I knew the winner of the Spurs and Suns was going to go to the finals. And I, I honestly, I thought the Spurs were just going to go all the way. Like, I, I always thought the Suns were pretenders and because they didn't guard. And then, obviously, the the East, uh, the East Western Conference Finals, Spurs and five. We know the finals sweep for the Spurs. So, content has been super clean recently. I appreciate you, bro. Let me throw that freaking uh, thing up there. E. Still mad about that suspension. What are you, a Suns fan, Big Ben? Mad about that suspension. Yeah, it ruined the series a little bit. But you know what's funny? I don't buy that Suns fans like go with, we would have definitely won the series if they hadn't gotten suspended. Who's to say that you're not going to choke a game seven at home? You're the fucking Suns with Mike D'Antoni and Steve Nash. It's not like you guys were some freaking elite, like insane championship team. Like, no, bro, you, you guys could have won, but I'm still betting on the Spurs. Like, that's the funny part. I'm always going to bet on the Spurs against the Suns. Come on, man. Those guys did not guard like that. Tim Duncan was the best player in the series. It ruined the Game 7 hype, I feel you. Yeah, I was kind of – I was disappointed. Not really, though. I didn't like the Suns, but I was just more hyped on – at that point, bro, I was a 9-year-old kid. So, oh, I was 8 year old, eight years old. I, was, I turned 9 in the summer, but I was all on the LeBron train, man. I was rooting for him so hard. I remember, like – where I was for game six, game four, game five. Like, I remember all three of those games. I even remember the, the talk around games one and two. As I said, who's the GOAT with the whole Danielle Marshall uh, thing? Missing the open threes that LeBron. That was the beginning of the LeBron making the right basketball play and not shooting at the end. <laughs> it's been going on for 15 years. That's the crazy, 16 years even. That's the funniest part. But. Man, that game five he put on was something else. He got so hot, and he just gave it everything of himself. And they could not stop him off the dribble. The thing about the the Cavs, too, is that they had shooters. Daniel Gibson had like 30-something points, like 28 points in game six. Just went fucking crazy. 
Um, that's that's why I hate when people say LeBron had no help. Like, how is he gonna? If he had no help, he wouldn't have made the finals because Booby Gibson wouldn't have made all those threes. He didn't have a championship team though, like for sure. He didn't have a second co-star, which made it incredible, you know. But again, Jason Kidd made it to the finals twice without like a true. You could say Kmart, but like like a true second scorer, you know. I'm sorry, like a true second star, bona fide. Kerry Kittle is a good player, but it's just the East in the the East in the 2000s. And you can say the same thing about Iverson, really. I mean, Matumbo. You can say the same thing about it. the East in the 2000s is weak. This East is so much better. But yeah, I mean, also because if you do that to my team, I'm going after you too. Yeah. I mean, it's instinctual. It sucked. I, I hated that rule that Stern implemented. Like, Amari took, like, a step off the bench, and he got suspended. That's going to be, like, I wonder if he still thinks about that a lot. Because, like, that was the closest he ever got to a ring. Although you can argue that 2010, he was kind of close. And then Ron Artest put back in game five. And then Kobe in game six. Oof. Talk about a closeout. Dude, Kobe was one of the best in terms of closing out series. He used to just have some vintage performances when it came to shutting down teams. like. Prime example, the Suns in 2010, the Nuggets in 2008 first round. It was a good game, and he just assassin, assassinated them at the end. And then the Nuggets in, in 2009, he was just cold-blooded in that one. People love to bring up LeBron's age when it goes bad. They call him the GOAT, and he still put up these numbers. Yeah. It's going to be real tough for Memphis versus Golden State. Yeah, I agree, Terminator92. Shout out to you, my guy. I see you on Twitter. Showing love as usual. Um, by the way, though, when people say that LeBron became the best player in the league after that, 2007, like, they're so stupid to me. Like, <laughs> I'll break it down on the time machine when we get to 2008. That's going to take years probably. But, like, Kobe, experience matters, guys. And that's, by the way, I have, I have a hot take. I'm going to unleash it in the next episode. But I have a hot take. I was wrong. Chris Paul is still better than, and than John Trey to me. John Trey may get their teams a little bit further if they carry their offenses in the regular season because Chris's lack of durability or whatever. But who are you taking come playoff time? I think if you put Chris on either of those teams, Memphis or Atlanta, they'd honestly play better in the playoffs. Like, I really think so because that mid-range, the mid-range is patience and decision-making, experience. That matters. You know what I'm saying? I'm taking Chris. He's so good. He's so calm on the ball. Low turnover. Jaws too out of control, too young. They're both just young. And I'm taking a year 17 that can still play, and he's a god in pick and roll over these guys. It's crazy because Chris Paul never, like, bursts, really, in half-court sets anymore. Like, almost never. It's so controlled. But anyway, Terminator92 says, oh, well, it doesn't matter to me. I like the Bucks and the Heat the best out of all the remaining teams. Giannis and Jimmy are my guys. Wow, not the Celtics? Oh, are you, are you, oh you're talking about who you want to win? Oh my God, he said it, it's going to take years. Bro, for 2008, it may take years. Because the modern NBA, I do both. You know, it, it, The modern NBA coverage stall, st stagnates the process. And the 80s and 90s is going to take a long time because I'm going to watch so much film. You're going to know, you guys, you guys are going to know Michael Jordan, Magic Johnson, Larry Bird, and Kareem, like as if you watch them live, if you, if you actually just watch my videos. Like you're going to, this is for you guys. This is for the world. For me too, but it's also for the world. And obviously, again, if you don't like my breakdown because I'm so choosing select plays and cherry picking or whatever, you can watch the full game yourself and come up with your conclusion. So that's it for me tonight, guys. Have a great weekend. I'll catch you guys on Sunday night, second round. It was awesome covering the first round for y'all. I really appreciate all the love. Uh, make sure to throw a super chat if you if you appreciate it. Throw, toss a dollar if you got one. I know we got a younger crowd in the lives. but And remember, make, remember, remember, remember to comment on this video after it's posted for the algorithms. Remember to turn the notification bell on so you know every time I'm going live and every time a video is out. And make sure you like and comment whenever a video is out. Make sure you retweet it if you're on Twitter. Big Ben says, excited to see how the Bucks do against the Celtics defense. Grayson Allen and Pat Connaughton were unleashed during the Bulls series. They're going to need to be big with Middleton out in this series. Good night, everybody.